Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Uh, please remember to like and subscribe. It helps the channel out a lot. Today, I wanted to kind of go on another Old Man Yells at Sky sort of rant. If you have watched some of my other videos, occasionally I will go off on unhinged tangents about the sorry state of conservation research and conservation biology, especially in concern with arthropods. And I have yet another terrible paper, uh, this time published in a journal from the Royal Entomological Society, which is all the more disappointing that this journal has fallen so far. And this paper was published, I believe, in November 2024, and it is about isopod conservation, so woodlouse conservation in Spain, and the author's absolute need for more woodlouse conservation for some reason. So this is one of the images from the paper. It's probably the only good image in the entire paper, and it's just some nice woodlice. And uh, if you aren't super familiar with these, so this is the same thing as like a pill bug or a roly poly, and these are a type of a terrestrial crustacean. And they're not really insects, but they do fall under the broader category of bugs. So here's the paper. It's called A Colorful World with a Dark Future, Unregulated Trade as an Emerging Threat for Woodlice of Spain. And this is an incredibly niche conservation topic, and which is one of the things that I frequently criticize conservationists of, is that they tend to find problems where there aren't any. And this is definitely one of those papers. So... But what is basically going on in this paper, the author's premise is that the breeding and trade of isopods is going to be detrimental to isopod conservation, which they are apparently very concerned about. This breeding and trade of isopods is being done because since about the mid 2000s, people have become more interested in them and they're used as pets in indoor like terraria and things like that. So they do make for some interesting little pets. They're easy to keep, they reproduce very easily, and there are some interesting colorations and color morphs of these available to buy. The research itself, I wouldn't, I, I mean, I hesitate to call it research. Basically what they did, their critical research, was they went online, they did Google searches for uh, people who were selling isopods, including searches on Facebook Marketplace and Reddit and Instagram, looking for people who would sell them isopods, and they documented what species were for sale and how long they've been for sale. So the, basically they looked at Google to see what was for sale. They documented the years that a lot of these stores started selling isopods, specifically only included public records which were available, and that they uh, did not include records which could not be easily accessed by the public, which I found problematic because uh, their framing for this is that it encouraged replicability of the study. Although the problem is, is if you have records which aren't publicly avail available, those are accurate records. So you've sacrificed accuracy to improve re replicability, which is not great. But the framing of this article kind of has a couple problems in my opinion. One. They talk endlessly about how no one seems to be doing any research on woodlice conserv or woodlouse conservation. They decried this as some great fail failing. I believe it, either in this paper or one of the papers that they cite, they just straight out call it negligence on the part of the conservationists, which I find ridiculous. The reason no one cares about woodlice conservation is because it's well outside the boundaries of things that are reasonable to care about. There are only so many res uh, resources that we can summon and put towards conservation efforts. We can't care about everything. And wood lice are not something that a typical person is going to support spending money on conserving, especially because uh, they're invertebrates, they're arthropods, they reproduce extremely quickly. One, people find them icky. And two, they're not really under any danger of going extinct, realistically. It's not like pandas, where they can't seem to figure out how to mate or eat a good diet. But specifically, they talk about how woodlouse conservation is not considered in existing legal frameworks. And that just isn't true. There is an existing legal framework to talk about the trade of invertebrates 
and uh, the conservation of invertebrates. It's just that wood lice don't meet any of the thresholds for caring about them. We have things like CITES, which prevent the trade of endangered or threatened species. We have things like agricultural restrictions. All Western countries have these things. But wood lice don't, call, they're, they're not pests. They don't carry any diseases. They're not particularly threatened. So they don't meet the threshold for anyone to actually care about this subject. Uh, so not only do people not care because they're just not interested, but people don't care because they're not actually of concern in any meaningful way. But that never stops a conservationist. Uh, so ignoring the, all of this that no one's actually concerned, ignoring the issues of limited resources when it comes to meaningful conservation, well, the authors get into their arguments. And in my opinion, they're kind of pursuing this sort of fallacious Mott and Bailey technique that you see quite a bit with conservationism, where they don't want to give their real arguments, which are functionally, uh, we must preserve endemic species because, and they never really fill in that uh, because, they never justify this, why they care so much for these very specific endemic species, and instead they fall back to this defensible position of, it's good for the environment, they're ecologically significant, blah, 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 blah. And they do this right off the bat in the introduction, and then they pursue this throughout the rest of the paper. Uh, basically, wood lice are important for soil turnover. They are detritivores. I, I hesitate to use the word important. They are detritivores. Uh, they are one of many detritivores. If you go into any soil environment, you are going to find tons of detritivores. But they are useful in soil turnover. They are useful in breaking down decaying things. Their argument is, well, they're important, but local harvesting for trade can harm local populations, it can reduce the density of these endemic species, and it could theoretically drive something to extinction. The obvious solution to this is brought up in the paper. Well, it's it's uh, brought up in the paper, but it's not endorsed in the paper, which is that a lot of these people that are collecting these isopods are actually breeding them. And so the solution is you breed more wood lice. You can actually breed these endemic species and you can always just release them back into the wild if you want, because wood lice reproduce extremely quickly. They're very easy to care for. This isn't a major problem. Uh, and not only that, we have lots of introduced species of wood lice that they go through that you can find within uh, the wood louse trade. They have endemic species, native species, probably introduced species, definitely introduced species that you can buy in Spain. And these introduced species tend to do extremely well in human disturbed environments. So you can even use these introduced species to help deal with soil turnover, if that is what your concern is. But that isn't what their concern is. That's just the mod that they're using in this their defensible position. You're not allowed to talk about intentionally introducing these species, introducing foreign species, even though they would help with soil turnover because, because it would have a, an impact on the endemism issue that they really, really care about these endemic species for some reason that they can't justify other than that they just like them. Uh, so that is off the table. So they use this sort of uh, obsession with endemic point source uniqueness nonsense to kind of move away from the obvious answer, which is that you could just, all of these uh, introduced species that you're poo-pooing could actually solve your problem of soil turnover. So their real argument is that we need to preserve endemism for some reason. They never actually justify this because it's not logically justifiable. And they even go through insane sorts of terminology where they talk about uh, genetic heritage being lost. And this sort of sale and reintroduction of things causing genetic pollution and things like this. Uh, it's not really logically justifiable. It's all very emotionally driven. They At no point do they present any sort of real argument for stopping this, but they do cite other authors who also make these same insane arguments. There's this one paper called Species Conservation Profiles of Cave Adapted Terrestrial Isopods in Portugal. You could probably not get a more niche topic. So not only are we only talking about terrestrial isopods, we're talking about terrestrial isopods only from the tiny country of Portugal and only which live in caves. It's this very, very niche topic. There's maybe 15 species that can be identified that fall into this category. And this author talks about how it's so terrible that uh, some of these could be threatened because 
humans do such terrible things like mine resources from the earth. It's just this insane sort of anti-humanism you find pervasive throughout conservationism. People aren't going to stop mining because of a cave isopod. It's just not going to happen. This sort of research or quote unquote research is never going to generate any sort of traction with the public. This is just a nonsense waste of resources. But back to this to this paper. So you have these crazy calls to preserve these very niche species. And like with the other paper, you need to limit mining. You need to limit building. You need to limit hiking. You need to limit people going into the woods. Uh, they continue to make sort of kind of ridiculous arguments when it comes to isopods and other invertebrates. They make reference to the possibility that actually trading and breeding these isopods will lead to their extinction because there have been other meta-analyses that reveal that traded legal or, or illegal species face a higher risk of extinction. And if you actually go to these papers, the species that they're particularly referring to are very slow breeding mammalian species or very slow breeding plants like cacti and orchids. And that is true uh, with these sort of slow breeding high demand species people do go out of their way to harvest from the wild uh, frequently taking mature species which are kind of on the or mature specimens which are on the cusp of reproduction and then you stop reproduction of these in the wild although there is a little horse and cart here uh are you putting the cart before the horse and that are people collecting them which is driving them to extinction or are they going to towards extinction and therefore there is a higher demand to collect them i don't know uh, but they have meta-analyses showing this for mammals and, and a handful of plants at least. But none of these analyses actually talk about arthropods. And the reason for that would probably be because you wouldn't find that trend. Generally speaking, arthropods are very easy to breed. They reproduce very, very quickly. They generally don't require a lot of maintenance. These isopods aren't going to be going extinct because of the terrarium trade. But that is one of their arguments. It doesn't really apply to the situation as far as I can tell. The wood lice that are appearing for trade, per these authors' own conclusions, many of them are clearly being bred in captivity for trade uh, because a lot of them carry characteristics which would not be found in nature. So individual color morphs that tend to be rare in nature are very, very common in the trade because people like these strange colors. So it just doesn't seem to be a problem. And then again, this is where they talk more about their complaints about genetic contamination of these endemic species and things like that. These are just deranged talking points. This has not this has no coherent meaning. This is just whatever exists in their mind. Now, now you're talking about keeping genetic lines pure for animals and things. It's just uh, very strange. But this gets into kind of more interesting things about invasiveness. This brings up, or rather the authors don't get into this, but it does bring up these topics, which is that invasive, what we call invasive, cosmopolitan species, species that do well with humans are actually probably a pretty good idea to have more of them around. They survive well in human environments. They're well adapted to human activity. Uh, so instead of allowing them to spread and speciate, conservationists become obsessed with this endemism topic um, and this obsession can't really be defended. Uh, humans aren't going anywhere. Civilization's not going anywhere. So you need to deal with this. So, and trying to protect every little endemic species, which is poorly adapted to humans, is a losing argument. You will never be able to defend this position. You will only succeed in bankrupting yourself on um, these kind of conservation push pushes for species that just aren't well adapted for people. Uh, conservationists act like humans are a problem that needs to be solved. And not only that, that it's going to be solved soon. Like any minute now, we're going to deal with the human problem. None of them ask if any of their efforts can be sustained, you know, reasonably sustained for 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. Do you think that uh, your attempts to maintain endemic cave isopods in Spain will be fruitful for the next 10,000 years or even the next 1,000 years, the next 100 years? Like, or is this just kind of a navel gazing experiment where you get to get all teary eyed about the poor cave bug or something? Like, it's just nonsense. And finally, they make their recommendations, which is basically uh, the government of Spain needs to crack down on people who are selling these bugs, collecting and selling these bugs. 
Uh, people need to be put out of business for doing this. And never mind that Spain has one of the worst economies in the European Union. Uh, they have very, very high youth unemployment that generally bounces between 20 and 30 percent. Uh, the people that are selling bugs for seven dollars for, you know, five isopods are not doing it because it, they're just raking in the cash. It's probably because they have no other jobs. And this is the same issue that you have with Amazon conservation and things like that. You, the people that are cutting down trees for to sell them have no other source of income in the Amazon. If Brazil and Brazil needs to deal with that by offering them better economic opportunities, the same goes for Spain. If you want people to stop collecting bugs and selling them for a couple bucks, then you need to offer them better economic futures instead of cracking down on them. It's just insane. But uh, I'll link to this paper and uh, this other paper on the species, the terrestrial isopods of Portugal if you want to read just absolute nonsense. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.